I'd like to welcome you. I'm Sammy Aaron, and I am the founder of The Resilient Activist. Um, we are on a mission to provide support, community building, and resilience tools for those who are working diligently to support a really healthy and resilient planet. <clears throat> um, I want to begin with our native land acknowledgement. This program created in the Kansas City area is on the ancestral lands of the Wyandotte, Osage, Kaw, Kickapoo, and Sioux Native American tribes. We honor our indigenous elders and know we have much to learn from them about how to live in deep connection to the natural world. We have some wonderful interviews on the Resilient Activists YouTube channel with Native Americans Kelly Daniels from the Blue River Forest Experience and Dr. Daniel Wildcat from Haskell Indian Nations University, and you might want to check those out. So I want to welcome back Professor Sarah Jaquette Ray from Humboldt State University, author of two seminal books on the impact of climate change, The Ecological Other, and A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety. You may want to watch the recording of our earlier Climate of Community event on climate anxiety with Dr. Ray on our YouTube channel. Sarah's here today to continue our conversations about climate anxiety within the lens of its intersection with environmental justice and racism. Today's program also includes Carly McCracken and Dr. Barbara Gilbert, who will add their thoughts during the program. Carly is the Reader Services and Literacy Librarian at the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library. She has a bachelor's degree in conservation biology and a master's in library and information science. Carly led a reading of a field guide to climate anxiety during April in partnership with the American Library Association's Resilient Communities. So Carly, when you first saw that that grant was available from the Library Association, I'm wondering what led you to pursue having that reading and bringing that to your community? Yeah. Um, so I actually didn't realize the grant was available at first. My supervisor passed it on to me because she was like, you, you do conservation. What do you think of this? Um, and I realized that the topic of sustainability, which is what this grant really focuses on, is climate change and education and sustainability. Oftentimes, it is viewed almost as something only for the affluent. Um, and the community in which I serve is not necessarily the absolute community. Um, Wyandotte County is one of the poorer counties here in Kansas. And I wanted to bring sustainability and climate change information to them, to, make, to my patrons, to make sure they understood that sustainability is not just for the rich. Climate change information is not just for the rich, well-educated professors. It is for everybody. All right. Well, thanks for doing that. I was such a great connection that we were able to make with that and with the Library Association. Dr. Barbara Gilbert's a clinical psychologist in private practice in Lawrence, Kansas. She addresses larger scale barriers to healthy functioning of the whole community. She offers a psychology-based path to true power for climate resilience and recovery through the Resilient Activist Climate of Community Programming. So for those of us who've been working in the environmental realm for many years, we understand that the intersection of environmental destruction and its resulting climate change, temperature rise, and severe weather events directly impact those communities that have historically been underserved, underrepresented, and underheard. Indigenous communities, inner city, lower income communities, and communities of color all bear the brunt of changing weather patterns, degraded health outcomes, and severe economic setbacks. As more and more people learn about the climate crisis, its causes and the overwhelming complexity of restoring healthy and resilient natural systems, they often begin to recognize the implications of these race and justice issues. Additional guilt and remorse about these heartbreaking humanitarian aspects of the state of our planet can add to our collective climate anxiety. So personally, my understanding of the intersection of climate change and environmental racism has deepened with recent participation in conferences like Taking Nature Black through the Audubon Naturalist Society, the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Environmental Justice's System Race, Systemic Racism series, the Mapping Inequality Project, 
and reading Randy Kritkowski's Without Reservation and being on the coordinating committee of the Kansas City Conservation Equity Network programs. I'm looking forward this evening to expanding my understanding and awareness of this subject through tonight's program. So here's how this session's going to go. Um, I'll ask a question. I'll invite Sarah's response. Barbara and Carly will have an opportunity to add their thoughts if they have some on that topic. And then we'll open it to audience questions and comments. And then we'll go on to the next question. Okay, so let's get started. First question, quote, hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Vaclav Havel wrote this in the 1960s. So does instinct or experience lead you to believe that individuals are equally innately resilient across generations or do life experiences for today's young people mean they are or have the ability to learn resilience in the same way as older people. And Sarah? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think the spirit of your question is getting at the question of whether or not there's something unique to this generation in terms of hope and resilience. And um, one of the things that I think is really a form of therapy for young people is a better sense of history and the struggles, uh, the historical struggles. Some students are, some young people are aware, I, I will refer to students because those are my young people that I work with, but um, y'all can consider it um, just sort of Gen Z or even late millennials um, that have some, some of them have a better uh, awareness of that history just because that history is more directly related to their sense of um, viability and, and thriving and their own community's um, legacies of struggle. Whereas some students um, have the privilege of sort of ignoring history, which is uh, a lot of times the way, the, certainly the way I was raised, especially as a Californian transplant, there was a sense of, you know, starting afresh, starting anew, nothing mattered in the past. And so one of the things that I think is a really helpful tool in the toolkit that I describe is to um, make sure students and young people are in touch with, if they are not already, their elders and people in their lives that have lived through struggles in the past. And that's not because um, our current struggle is the same as past struggles or that it's, um, you know, in some ways it's, it's totally connected. <laughs> in other ways, it's quite different. Um, so, but rather than, than that, I, I really think that what they're trying to get is a sense of perspective, a historical perspective that people have really struggled and people have not known that they would survive. Um, historical trauma and and they have found ways to keep engaged in the work despite the fact of not having any certainty about the about the outcome of that work and um, so what what can we learn from them and maybe that's a lot closer to us than we know right maybe there's a there's knowledge about that or there's wisdom in our elders and our relationships that we we might want to learn from and so that, that's a kind of a, a, a tool in the toolkit of my book, actually, that I outline. And it's something I asked my students to do, go interview somebody and ask them, how do they find hope? <laughs> what were their skills of resilience? Uh, we're not reinventing the wheel here. You know, um, people have been through a lot of trouble in the past and they have figured out how to get through it and how to keep working. Uh, one refrain I hear from young people often is what I call in the book, the apathy trap. And it's a, it's a real common struggle within the climate movement, and especially among young people, is this form of learned helplessness that occurs because of the way that the problem of climate change is framed as something so large and so structurally interconnected to so many different problems that there's no point in even trying to get involved in working on it. One person's efforts can, can't possibly make a difference. And that is such a common refrain that I'm sure everyone here <laughs> agrees with it, has felt it, and has navigated that themselves, and has battles with people in their lives over it, you know, like you still have to save that straw, you know, um, even if it doesn't make a difference, or whatever it is that we've all engaged in. And I think that the, the one of the workarounds, I think that's kind of a futile, a futile dead end of a conversation. And one of the workarounds for that to me is to 
really think about the fact that um, we are in a we're in a different type of moment where we have to find reasons to do the work we're doing, even if we have no evidence that the outcome of that saving of that straw is going to result in something we'll ever see, um, even if we know darn well that it is just a drop in the bucket, and that there's there are other reasons to engage in the work, and we have to explore what those reasons are. Um, in the book, I call it the myth of uh, the myth of instrumentalism, and I'm thinking here about the the real fetishizing of action and fetishizing of outcomes and fetishizing of deliverables that happens in capitalist society that also affects the activist world, um, and the sort of burnout that and and the sort of treadmill productivity that actually um, is even worse probably in the activist world than it is in <laughs> capitalism, which has actually turned self care into a, a, a cottage industry. So I sort of, um, you know, try to give young people that, that framework and this is a new way of thinking about uh, other sources and other people who've done resilience and hope and, and other motivations for why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and yeah, I do, think, I do think young people are living through a different kind of um, global level of trouble. We are in a time of um, what some people call the era of acceleration, multiple types of accelerations that, um, are unprecedented um, for, in terms of technology and information, in terms of you know, the movement of goods and people ac across the planet, and in terms of the speed of that as well, in terms of the 24 seven connectivity to all of the planet's problems and human humanitarian problems across the planet. We've never had such access to that information and that knowledge. The forms of vicarious trauma that spiral from that are, are new than, and new and in a way that young people have never been taught and we haven't, I haven't been taught how to deal with that. So, you know, they are, and then quite frankly, the, the health of the planets, the planetary, you know, planetary um, ecosystem of the planet um, is, is unprecedented. And what, what we're watching in the forecasts, even the IPCC forecasts are, are toned are toned down, you know. <laughs> They're shaped by governments, not by scientists. So in some ways, even they are not really as accurate as what really are the forecasts of scientists. Um, so they've been watered down to not shock people. So really, the the forecasts of what what are coming is is an, is something unprecedented. And I, so I do think young people are facing um, a level of uh, future future fear and future anxiety. Um, what uh, some people call anticipatory anxiety or anticipatory grief um, that I really think characterizes my definition of climate anxiety in the book, which, which can also include traumas and anxieties that are happening in the current present moment as well. But this notion of watching this unfold right before our eyes and into the future, accelerating at a rate that is faster than, than what even the scientists have been predicting um, is a unique thing for young people. They're being asked to um, not to surrender all of the same kind of life course uh, expectations that um, many generations before them have taken for granted. Um, even even under oppressive conditions, uh, the expectations of how their lives will unfold is are being changed before their very eyes. Thank you, Sarah. Who has some comments? Adding on to that. Oh, Charlie, go ahead. Sorry. Um, adding on to that. So like I myself am a young person. Um, I'm at that cutoff for millennial. I'm 26. And I understand this difficulty with like resiliency um, because at my generation has not experienced, as Sarah has mentioned, like this almost like golden age, these like other hopes. But on the flip side of that, you know, I do work with um, ages 12 through 15 quite often. And the amount of um, activism and work that this new generation is willing to put in is quite amazing. Um, even though they are coming from seeing gloom and doom constantly being connected to their phones, knowing that there is this level of things that they cannot change, um, they're still inspired. And I think that provides more inspiration. I think each generation has their own difficulties to overcome, but I think this newest generation, this younger generation of activists um, face something so insurmountable because they haven't seen necessarily the good times, um, but they continue to work towards that. Yeah, I'd love to, if it's okay if I jump off of Carly just for one moment, um, that 
that the other side of the story of this generation is that they do have a, a, a set of superpowers that um, in addition to worrying about them, in addition to um, making sure we validate that they're in a uniquely difficult position, we, shan't, we shouldn't just turn around and say, good luck with that, um, you know, or turn around and say, it's your responsibility. This, you're, this is going to be on your shoulders. You better, you know, be up for the challenge. Those things are pretty rude, <laughs> you know. They land on my students as really rude, you know. They, they find that just um, hypocritical to the extreme, um, that this mess that we couldn't figure out how to, how to clean up, we're putting on their shoulders in that way. And so I think that the alternative to that is to really lift up their superpowers, as Carly just mentioned, and say, these are the unique talents. This is the unique demographics of this generation. This is what they care about. Over 70% of them care deeply about climate change across political boundaries are the most ethnically diverse generation that, that the US has ever seen, even as they're the most economically worse off and they will be the worst off of any generation. They're the first generation that will be worse off than their parents. Um, but they are also the largest generation we've ever seen. They're mo they're, they feel most politicized and politically active than any generation we've ever seen. And there's so many fantastic things that they bring that uh, when you work with young people like I do all the time, and it sounds like Carly too, um, that is a, itself a source of hope. And people often ask me, how do you keep hope? And I said, gosh, I'm working with 100 students every year who I have every confidence are going out into the world and magnifying their impact at rates I can't even imagine in this these amazing ways. And I just, right before this, I had an alumni panel of environmental studies major come back to talk to current majors and they all talked about what they've been doing for the last five or six years. And it was just overwhelming, overwhelming. And so, um, you know, young people have that energy in a way and they're flexible and adaptable and changeable in a way that I'm not, I'm all nossified, you know, in my ways, you know, um, and they're just, you know, they're just inventing the worlds they want, right, left, and center. But they, but if they are um, finding that, um, it, what they really do need is that critique of dominant society that is keeping them down, right? So once they get that, you know, oh yeah, society wants me to feel powerless. Oh yeah, society wants me to feel like an individual. Oh yeah, society wants me to be like they're just giving me the doom and gloom. They're not giving me all the models of how things are going well. So once they get the kind of critique of 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 living in a different ecosystem of information and 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 ideologies, they they're off and running, and it's quite an amazing thing to see. Yeah, that's very hopeful. I in my clinical work, of course, I see people who are struggling more rather than feeling that hope and energy as much but it's really not a hard stretch to, my specialization is working with people who are traumatized especially as children and their families and you know they already have done all this they already had to face that the big people didn't know what they were doing they already had to get through really difficult circumstances without nearly enough empowerment and you know so helping them get how they got through that then it's it's not that hard for them to imagine that they might be powerful and become more powerful um, as they address the, these kinds of issues too initially it feels like there's a oh no you know i thought i got away from this and here it is all over the world literally this dysfunction so you know i'm doomed but you know then they can make that switch to they you know they handled the trauma and the disempowerment of their families and they have skills they have skills that other people who didn't go through that don't have yet and are just now developing uh, but to get to that question too about you know can people develop resilience i've not ever met a single person literally ever who couldn't develop more resilience than they currently have you know and everybody hears me say this all the time i'll be working on it till i'm 99 because you're never done you know there's always another refinement you can make um, and so uh, that makes me hopeful too, that as we understand more and more about what actually needs to happen, then we can help people plug themselves into that. And I, I guess that's the biggest part of what I see as resiliency, no matter how old you are, is that it's important to figure out what's yours to do, not try to do everything, but what's yours to do according to what matters most to you. And either assume that other people are doing it or hold them accountable to step up and do what's theirs as well. And, you know, there's no way if we're all doing that, that we're not going to get at least closer to where we need to get and, and hopefully a little faster. So I stay really hopeful about all generations. And, you know, it's interesting to think about how 
um, prolonged this trauma, if you want to call it, I don't actually call it that it's um, certainly a highly challenging situation, but it doesn't matter. It's a psychological terms issue, but we mean the same thing. But, you know, when I was little, um, we had the nuclear crisis. Um, and for years of my childhood, we didn't know if the Russians were going to blow us all. You know, of course, we thought it was only going to be the Russians, right? Um, and we did live with that. But it, it was at some point contained. And it wasn't right in our faces. It wasn't, you know, that we went, you know, we saw tornadoes hit where they never, it, that wasn't happening. It wasn't in our faces. And at some point we all got comfortable that that wasn't going to happen. This is different. Like if we project it forward, there is no end point that we can definitely look for. So I think there is a different kind of challenge to this. And similarly with my grandparents' generation or even my parents' wars, a lot of the big wars um, hit, hit people that way, the world wars in particular, you can still hear people talk about how despairing and hopeless it all seemed and that the world was never going to be normal or um, livable again somehow. And so um, I do think that look at history is going to help people, but also this is, this does feel different because we don't know, we can't predict an end to it. So those are my thoughts right now. I'll let other people jump in. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so anybody in the peanut gallery there have any comments, anything they want to ask, add, reflect on? All right, I'm, I've got one thought. Um, I've, in the past, I've taught a lot of workshops on how to restore native wildflowers, put in pollinator habitat in a suburban garden. And I can't tell you how many times the whole concept of not holding on to the outcome, right? Doing my thing, my, my shtick, the, the, my superpower, the thing that I just love and really love to teach and not holding on to the outcome. And I have been so surprised so many times by someone who took a workshop for me three years ago, right? I hadn't heard from them at all, ran into them somewhere, probably at a native plant sale. And they're telling me all about the gorgeous native pollinator gardens that they that they put in on the basis of that one, one hour session. And I never knew that that was happening. And I think that that's a big part of it is we don't always get the feedback, even if we're getting the response that we want, we don't always know about it. And that pragmatism of, for me, the practice of mindfulness, of practicing that being with whatever is, giving whatever's mine to give without any holding on, without any expectation, is has been a fantastic resilience tool for myself. So anyway. Let's put that out there. All right, next question. I'd like to say something. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Maybe. just, uh, uh, you know, I, in reading Joanna Macy's book, Act of Hope, recently, uh, you know, there was one point where she, she talks about long time and, and she gave, as an example, she gave uh, the building of a cathedral, I think, in uh, England that took uh, 250 years to build. And uh, so all of the uh, you know, carpenters and masons and uh, everybody else who worked on that cathedral uh, until the last 70 years or so, <laughs> probably less than that back then, uh, they knew that, that they would die long before the cathedral was done, you know? So, so you know, that's just an, that's an allegory for the attitude that we need to have in relation to uh, building uh, a sustainable world, because it's, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen in 20 years or 30 years. It's going to be hundreds of years. So it's just, it's, uh, uh, it really is, it really is, you have to have that kind of perspective. Um, from Thank my you, standpoint. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The very scale of the climate justice issue is overwhelming. How can we individually and as a community work to break down the problems into manageable pieces or actions? 
how can we develop resilience yet advocate for resistance of the status quo? For example, racism, sexism, economic injustice, and so on. So kind of breaking it down into workable pieces and that balancing of what we're trying to accomplish in the meantime, also trying to make changes in, in related fields. That seems like two questions. Yeah, am I about right? Okay. <laughs> um, so about the first question about how, how you break it down and figure out which part to tackle. Um, it is so overwhelming and there's so many parts. And I think um, part of the, that, that has so many directions I'd love to go in. And so forgive me if I digress in multiple places, but um, one of the things, one of the problems with the way climate justice is being framed is that when it is connected to so many different things, it becomes intractable. It feels like it's, there's no, no way to tackle it. And so I think one of the challenges for climate educators and climate communicators, which is the sort of field that I spend most of my time in, is to, is to break it down in analysis, in forms of analysis, like, okay, where is, is the cause of, of climate injustice colonization? Is the cause of climate justice overpopulation? Is the cause of climate injustice capitalism, certain forms of capitalism? Is the, you know, and, and to have these debates about where the cause is, because we don't want to spend, we don't want to waste our energy trying to attack what we think the cause is without robust analysis of that of that cause. And so, you know, one of the things I tell my students is that while you're very impatient because you feel like the moment is urgent and you can hardly stand and even sit in this class, much less get your education, um, you know, the work it takes to understand where you're going to put your direction, you know, and which I always think of us, ourselves as like being in a sailboat and trying to figure out which, which like hair of an angle are we as our compass where we're going to head towards, you know, but wherever we set our compass matters, you know, we don't want to waste a lot of time going one direction and then come to find out when we get a little more wisdom a few years down the line that, that that's really been not the direction you want to go. I mean, that happens anyway, that's going to be inevitable. There's a certain amount of journeying that goes on here, but sometimes spending some time really thinking about what, what are the sort of places where interconnections, where the energies can be spent the most effectively and efficiently to tackle as most problems as you can. And, and that has to be combined also with inner exploration, not just intellectual analysis, but inner exploration about who you really are and what you can and can't do. You know, I spent, I, I got my degree in, a, in undergraduate studies in religion. And then I decided after I graduated that I really wanted to do justice work. And so I went out to do justice work for the first five years of being out, out of college. And it took me, I don't know, 10 or 15 years after that to realize that these were not separate worlds, you know? <laughs> that, I, that I wasn't just gonna give up my inner exploration so that I could work on exterior work, which points a little bit to your second question, which I do wanna get to. But you know, this notion that, um, you know, there's there's only one right way, right way to do it. That power and action only exist in this one limited form, and we all have to be doing it. Is really problematic. It causes students to be self righteous when they see people, you know, other people not doing the same thing. It gives them a sense of sort of a zealotry about their actions. It gives them this purity politics that allows them to to judge and discipline and berate other people for not recycling or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, you know. Our, our notion of um, what are the best ways that everyone should be tackling this causes us to judge other people and causes more friction and divisiveness, which we have enough of in this country. And so, and sometimes I even say in the book, and I think this, I truly think this, that many, many people are doing very important related things to climate justice, and they never even have the word climate or environment or justice in any of the key words that you would ever do to search that. And I tell my students, don't use a keyword environment when you're looking for your job, you know, your jobs after college. Look at absolutely everything and bring the environment to it. That's actually the, the way we're gonna do this work and bring the justice dimension to it. I mean, these students who just came for this alumni panel, it was amazing to me the different, the disparate fields they were all in from construction to art, to education, to nonprofit work. And they all say the thing that they are bringing to these different places is this lens and that they would hate to have been told that they had to do this one track for a career. And that's just, that's sort of this response to this question, how do I figure out my one where my place where I'm going to intervene and that that inner exploration coupled with that analysis you know, that, that work it takes in college and the work it takes to do your research to figure out what what is happening, what are the cause and ca causal relationships between problems. 
um, helps you figure out where you're gonna intervene. And I have students do a visualization exercise about what it is that the work that they will have done to, to manifest the future they desire. And that helps them clear through some of the junk in their minds about what they really care about. I have them do a spheres of influence exercise to help them figure out where they already have forms of power and where they have forms of, of network that they can build on. Their sort of asset mapping of their existing assets. Um, we have them do wandering map exercises where they can sort of see threads and themes through their life of their passions so that they don't just decide, well, the only way to make change in this world is to be an economist or a politician or rich or something, right? I have to be Bill Gates to make a difference or something. Um, those limited notions of how culture change happens and how social change happens, how power works, what action looks like, um, are things that we try to sort of unsettle. And, and that helps students, I think, sort through a little bit about, it gets them um, away from all the things that they've been told that they should be doing to make a difference, what they told power looks like, what they've been told by society they need to do to pay the bills, to really thinking about what it is that their kind of calling is on the planet, which I think is a really different question. It's really heartbreaking that what we have in college is we've taught students that they have to give up their passions to figure out a way to just get on the treadmill to support their individualist little nuclear family, you know, anti-environmental unsustainable model of capitalist life you know it's just heartbreaking so what can we do to kind of work against that and the stuff that we're doing with young people and for every young person it's going to be very different and i and i hope so i really hope so we're not just producing one kind of thing here um and then to go to the second question about resilience and resistance um i think that there is a myth and i'm preaching to the choir here i'm sure but there's this myth that Either I'm doing internal work and that's navel gazing or I'm doing external work and that's service. And that's the cause, right? And, and anybody who's really done serious, serious social activism um, knows, knows what burnout is like and knows that that doesn't do their cause any good and knows how to <laughs> make sure they're bringing the trilogy of heart, hand and head into their work. And that the action, the thinking and the the you know, emotional resilience, the heart, are in this kind of mutual relationship and they all need to be resourced at all times and that we don't just expend one at the cost of the others. Um, so that that's wisdom from social movements. That's not, that's not wisdom just from psychology. Um, and so what I'm thinking here is that um, I find it, I find it a, a um, I find it upsetting, but then also like kind of a like a journey people go through have to go through burnout to know how if they really want to serve the planet in this particular way, they simply have to take care of themselves and that these two things are connected. The planet, your children, your family, your friends, justice, your cause, whatever your cause is, none of those things um, want you to burn out. You know, they need you to be fully there and present to serve their, their health, their health, right? So um, once that kind of dawns on people, I think that kind of weird masochistic thing that happens about, I think especially young people get the message that they are complicit in the problems. It's kind of like a biblical, you know, you've been banished from the garden, original sin kind of narrative that fits so well with the environmental movement, the environmental movement, lots of people who study narrative will talk about how one of the reasons why the environmental movement has been so successful is because it's globbed onto this kind of prelapsarian before original sin, things were so great with nature, but it was when we divided from nature, we were banished from the garden, you know, and so we have to get back to the garden. And so there's this kind of, you know, um, self berating, punish yourself, I'm complicit in the problems. And so what I should do is work myself into the ground as a way to make up for it. Um, myth, this is sort of ethos of the environmental movement and my young, my students who, who feel that they are, should be sort of eternally punished for being on the planet. Um, burn themselves out, right? And so it's a real change of thinking to think actually the planet needs you. You know, you're not a you're not a burden to the planet. You're not your impact on the planet is not only negative, it's positive. So what positive impact are you gonna have on the planet? Not just, you know, what's your leave no impact, leave no trace, erase yourself kind of form of environmentalism. What when you bring your full self to the planet, what does that look like? And it, it involves, it requires 
being resourced, you know, being, having your cup be full of energy. And we all know what re that's required. That's bodily chemistry. That's community. <laughs> that's a media diet and a social media diet. That's, you know, pausing. That means inaction is a kind of action, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, this binary between resistance and resilience, I think is, um, is, is, is really common and it's particular to the environmental movement. I think that social justice movements, other social justice movements have had more wisdom about that, that they're slowly bringing through the climate justice movement. They're bringing that, that kind of self-care ethos into the climate movement um, because they haven't, they, you know, simply put, um, survival and the viability of your life is the point of your, of your cause. And so protecting yourself and caring for yourself every single day is a form of resistance. And I think social movements know that. And you think about civil rights movement, you think about feminist movement, you think about lots of places where you know, the movement, the whole point of the movement is our very lives, our joy, our even delight, our ability to reproduce is itself under threat. And so to protect that is the resistance. And I think, um, I think that the environmental, the climate movement is, is starting to figure that out too. Um, but it's not a luxury to take care of yourself. It's a requirement, <laughs> I guess is my point. <laughs> our resilience is our resistance. I'm gonna have to quote you on that. <laughs> it wasn't me who said that. I, I'm pretty sure that that is in Elena Aguilar's book, Onward, which is about, um, which is a book title, a subtitled, um, something like resilience for educators or something like that. So I can't take credit for that. <laughs> Barbara? Yeah, I had a bunch of thoughts as I seem to always have when Sarah and I are in the same space. Um, I, we had a mind meld somewhere along the way and end up ha having many of the same thoughts. But, you know, when you were asking about you know, the, the steps, how do you break it down? I was smiling some because I, early when I started to get involved in trying to bring this into the community, I was asking a friend of mine who's a social psychologist if they had any thoughts to offer. And she wrote back and she said, yes, here are the steps to ending the climate crisis. Number one, end capitalism. Number two, smash the patriarchy. Number three, uh, and white supremacy. <laughs> so she was like, yeah, okay, let's break it down. Um, but ultimately, I think it, a, a lot of it has to do with, and it, you know, this, I think Sarah already said this in other terms, but I, th I think of it as people taking charge of the narrative for themselves. You know, the why um, is a big part of the narrative and positioning themselves in that, that story somehow that helps them see their direction even when as others have pointed out you might not see the full outcome but you have some sense of where you fit into the whole picture um, and and then the other part of it is to challenge other people with respect enough respect to account for their narratives you know it comes down to these really interpersonal i think interactions with people because that's where our realm of influence is. And of course we can vote and we can have policy change and work towards that. But even that I believe happens through relationship. Um, and that accountability process, you know, it's, um, it's not a hundred percent always the case, but in many, many cases, highlighting, you know, asking somebody to explain or account for themselves without shaming being part of it you know, the, the dysfunction shows up. It's certainly the most effective way people have challenged me on things like racism or internalized sexism or whatever else I might not have been uh, able to see yet. It's when they say, how do you explain this though? And doing that without shame helps all that come to light. And it's pretty hard to get behind it unless you're certain people we don't want to mention anymore because the term is over. <laughs> um, you know, but generally speaking, people can't, tolerate looking at their own dysfunction without you know, wanting to change that. Uh, again, there are exceptions. Um, let's see, uh, the other metaphor that people have used um, that I like a lot is people have said, it's really a long relay race. You know, it's a relay race. We hand off when we're tired. We don't keep carrying it on. It's not this you know, individual marathon that's all on us to do. And if we think about that change process as a relay race and that, you know, it's our job to hand it off to people who are fresher or more able in that moment, then we get a lot further. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Um, uh, 
I'll go ahead then. Um, I think, yeah, feeding off of both um, Barbara and Sarah here, I think meeting your community at where, it at, where they are at is extremely important, um, but also recognizing to not self-sacrifice, not delve into martyrdom, which I think a lot of us struggle with, especially if we are part of really any cause, you know, if I, my body isn't out there, whose body will be? Um, but as Sarah really touches on in her book, we are not alone. Obviously in the Zoom, we can see that we're not alone. And so that re resilience as an act of resistance, I don't know why, but that's, well, I do know why that blew my mind when I read it. Um, because I think oftentimes we do, tend towards martyrdom. We tend towards overstressing about things that we don't have control over. And that's not going to get things better. That's not going to keep us in the fight. That's not going to keep anybody in the fight. And as David um, kind of mentioned that cathedral, I really love that as an analogy. Um, we are all building this kind of cathedral of uh, climate change resistance and we're working on it all together, but we won't see the fruits of our neighbors necessarily. But it's important that we continue on, but also take time for ourselves because we're not alone. Thanks, Carly. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so anybody in the audience have something they'd like to add to that? Any experience that you'd like to share of figuring out how to be more resilient or how to break things down into smaller pieces? Anyone have any thoughts about it? All right, I'm going to post- Actually, Tammy, I'm just gonna share okay. my example just to maybe help everyone feel a little bit more comfortable um, of what like resiliency to me personally looks like. So I do work in a library. Um, well, it's not necessarily, it, it is kind of, it can be very stressful. It's a lot of giving myself to others. Um, personally, like mindfulness, whether that's taking time to do a coloring page, doing some meditation, um, taking a hot bath and just focusing on yourself, things like this add to my resiliency because I'm giving care to myself. I love it. And giving yourself permission to give care to yourself. Yeah. Um, Barbara mentioned something about she when she and Sarah get together and these thoughts just flow. I'm putting in the chat box. They did a radio interview with David Mitchell, who's also on the call. It just came out last this past Monday. So on uh, Kansas City's Eco Radio. So I just put the link there for anyone who'd like to go listen in. All right. Next question. What is the antidote to the climate movement's elitist reputation? And can you first explain what elitist means in this context? Yeah. Um, in the past, I remember when I first started being exposed to climate stuff, when I, so I had my PhD in environmental science studies and policy, and I was studying from 2000, I started studying climate change probably as early as 2000, one or two. And I was um, really wrapped up in criticizing it, actually, because I came to environmental studies from a social justice background, as I mentioned. And so I actually came to thinking about the environment as a form of social control. So I was pretty, I came to environmental studies pretty critical about, you know, big monolithic environmental explanations for things because I was hell bent on, um, uh, exposing the social injustice in them and that they, I, I was thinking about how it is that environmental stories get told in ways that the um, implications or the outcomes of what we should do about those problems oftentimes resulted in various forms of oppression. So for example, when we had the 1960s population bomb airlift kind of moment, where the environmental movement really got galvanized around this problem of so-called overpopulation, um, this really had huge impacts on, on the reproductive rights of women of color across the planet. And finally, the Global South feminist movement and feminists 
um, responded and corrected that and exposed the neo-Malthusianism within that and the fault, faulty logic within that argument. And um, there have been other examples of this, for example, um, around climate change, um, climate change itself in the early days of climate change, the kind of coming anarchy narrative around climate change was about how this was going to cause all these climate refugees and we should really create, make climate change an issue of national security and use it to justify militarization. And so there's real, um, there's real social justice arguments against climate change, right? I mean, that were, that were in the early days. And that was the way I came to thinking about climate change. I kept thinking climate change is this weird like global thing that's about polar bears and ice caps. And the people studying it are these like white privileged scientists who are thinking about things at the global scale, but really the average person, especially people who are, you know, um, not privileged are experiencing things on a much more local and intimate scale. And the research that was being done around climate change, I thought was really fascinating was that people would not care about and this, the big question at the time was how do we get something that's so abstract, like temporally abstract, like it's some in undefinite time in the future this is going to unfold and we don't know and scientific uncertainty is not you know doesn't we don't have it yet and also like you know scientifically abstract i can't understand how this stuff that's happening in the you know in the poles is gonna or you know the circulation of currents or something is going to affect me right how is how is that going to affect me here in in new orleans or wherever i am and then we start the, the discourse started to shift when people started to see New Orleans being a great example after something like Katrina, that there is a connection between poverty and experiences of climate change. And that that was a real moment of, of I think make bringing climate change to the forefront of not being elitist was all of a sudden when people could start to draw the connections between bad things that were happening were happening disproportionately to people who are already vulnerable. Um, low-lying nations are already tend to be very vulnerable economically speaking and geographically speaking. Um, we put we tend to put people through redlining and districting and various other kinds of um, you know real estate issues that people who are do planning know better into into places that are called ecolog ecological marginalized places that are vulnerable to to environmental catastrophe. So these sort of sacrifice zones and sacrifice people started to become the environmental justice arguments about those things started to enter into the climate world. And so environmental justice has been talking about this for some time. Like I said, there was a real anti-climate, anti-environmental justice movement that happened out of the 60s civil rights movement too, that was saying, hey, on the mainstream environmental movement has all these problems. You know, they're, they they want to reinforce the existing power structures. They're not really taking into account all these different um, perspectives on, on these environmental claims. And the climate movement is now coming around to some of that too. And the very notion that we now, may, in the mainstream, we now know that the people most vulnerable to climate change are the people least likely to be causing climate change. And that, that distributive inequality is part of the mainstream consciousness is a testament to how it's becoming less elite. Now that said, there is still the assumption everywhere that environmental issues and climate issues are not of interest to vulnerable people or people of color because it's still this abstract concept or that it is only something that elite people have the time to be thinking about. And from, from my experience, that's just simply not true. And, you know, I often, I remember in the early days, I would ask my students, you know, why do we not see, I was looking at Dorsetta Taylor's research, Green 2.0, where she analyzed the amount of people of color that were in dominant environmental, the Big Ten environmental organizations. And um, there has been more research followed up since that research, but, and you can find all that stuff on, on Google, just search it's super fascinating. Um, Kind of trajectory of how that's been changing but the lack of you know what's up with the lack of, of representation and my students would say oh I, people of color don't really care about the environment and so there's a sort of assumption that because they don't care about it we can just therefore not include them in these discussions right that it's too abstract they care too much about police brutality they're, they're caring about pollution in their own communities so they, they can't possibly be bothered with this other stuff and that's a real problem that's another that is the i would say the latest form of elitism around climate justice that in fact um many communities the communities experiencing the effects of climate change the most are com are 
have long traditions of environmental awareness and a long traditions of organizing around environmental injustice. And climate change is another iteration of the various forms of injustice that they've been experiencing. And it isn't just about climate to them, which is one of the reasons why you might not see climate as their top priority, but that doesn't mean that climate isn't wrapped up in all the things that are their top priority, right? So there's a sort of, um, the the the, tro the trouble is in the in the in the sort of ways that we, we frame them. The elitism is often in the ways that the, the problems are framed. And so um, you know what you have what you have there is oftentimes this battle over um, is it climate or is it structural racism? Well, to somebody who's experiencing both, those two things are interconnected. And I think that the real rub still that we have in the climate movement around elitism is that we might have a lot of people willing to say that climate change is gonna have an uneven impact on people who are vulnerable. And so we should pay attention to that. That we could probably get a lot of consensus around and that's awesome. But we, where we don't get consensus and where we have a lot of, a real lot of fracturing and I've noticed this in recent weeks because I just published an article on this where I got the, the flack, you know, like the, I got the fallout of, what, of that argument. Um, where the real rub is, is when, if we start to say that it's not just that climate change is gonna exacerbate existing inequalities, but that existing inequalities that are caused by structural racism, for example, is actually the cause of climate change or that there's at least a mutually, mutually reinforcing relationship there. It's not just that climate change is gonna have these impacts. That's always the way it's framed. That's the dominant way of framing it. But in fact, that structural racism that's making these people vulnerable is, the, is actually fueling climate change, is causing climate change. And so if we wanna address climate change, it's not just about taking carbon out of the atmosphere, it's about addressing structural racism. Now, when you, now you have this debate over, well, where are we gonna put our resources? That seems like a waste of time. We're never gonna get rid of, we're never gonna abolish, you know, a, we're never gonna get abolition to happen. We're never gonna get, you know, decon the land back to indigenous people. Let's just never do those things um, because those things, you know, we can't achieve those things and to get to climate to, to get to climate health. So why don't we just do this one thing that seems a lot easier, like getting carbon out of the atmosphere? And that debate is is really where the elitism manifests now, right? There's a sense of, gosh, it seems a lot, a lot easier to give the land back to some people. It seems a lot easier to abolish, you know, the existing, you know, sort of structural racism and police force. That seems actually a lot easier than taking carbon out of the atmosphere to me, right? I mean, so there's so there's a there's a real there's real friction in what are gonna be the most important urgent steps we should take to fix this problem? And, and around issues of racism, around issues of, of colonization, white supremacy, the answers to that question are really different. And I think that's where we still, we still have a lot, of, a lot of way to go to get to consensus around that. That was a long answer, but that's my passion right now, sorry. <laughs> long answer, good answer. Who's got a comment? Carly? Yeah. Um, adding on to that, I think also highlighting um, local stories of success within communities is a really big part of taking this elitism away from it. Um, recently, um, in Kansas City, there's a community called Turner, Kansas, and we did a video over their community garden, um, bringing it down to that local level, bringing it down to local community leaders really impacts that message. I think also, if you're, as Sarah pointed out, you know, like there are so many issues and you can be so overwhelmed with them. So what does it matter to me if polar bears are starving, if I live in a food desert and I can't provide food for my family? So making sure that when we talk about these issues, we are recognizing the issues that a community is facing and also that our solutions to climate change doesn't include consumerism. Well, if you want to be a better environmentalist, then just go buy metal straws to save the turtles. If you want to be a envi better environmentalist and help fight climate change, buy LED light bulbs. If you constantly connect a message of climate change to consumerism, you're not going to connect people and you're gonna further that elitist narrative. I love that. I love that point you make, Carly, that, um, dominant culture has told us all that our power as individuals lies in our power as consumers. And then we only really in a neoliberal model have an identity of ourselves as consumers. And every time we have, even at my local co-op, it says vote with your fork, you know? And it's like, 
it's like this reinforcement that my consumption is the way I'm going to get to this ecotopia that I want, you know? And so I love that. And also casting light on examples of success is a huge, very hugely important in local examples of success, because as Sammy said, that's the only place that we have, or no, it's Barbara. Those are our spheres of influence is our local area. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have much to add to what either of you are, have been saying, but I do want to give a shout out to the Sunrise Movement folks who I think have done an incredibly impressive job, you know, conveying that highly complex understanding of things and, and breaking it down enough that people can grasp it and, and get on board with it. So I've been thrilled with what's happening there. I'll just add that you know, you were talking a question or two prior to this one, Sarah, about not having to use the words climate change and, you know, temperature rise and whatever in talking about the issues. And there is there is a neighborhood in the Kansas City, Missouri side um, that's called East of Troost. And Troost is it's just all paved, you know, it's just, uh, just paved. And um, they did a, a study a while back that showed that because of the lack of tree cover and the uh, the amount of cement that's there, the temperature range there was, of course, a lot higher than out in the suburbs where there's a whole lot of trees. And they correlated that directly with the uh, mortality, infant mortality, infant and mother mortality rates right here in the Kansas City the whole city and it was, you know, same hospitals, same doctors, different people living in different environments. And I know that that's, you know, it's that that truce neighborhood is historically and predominantly a black neighborhood. And um, it's, it's so obvious. And so there's an organization called Uzazi Village that started and they do prenatal, postnatal, you know, maternal care, midwives and so on. And it's right there in the heart of that neighborhood because they know that this is, uh, this is what's happening. And whether they use the words climate change or not about it, it's directly related to climate change and to increased temperature and lower birth weight. So anyway. Well, such a great example, Sammy. I love that example. And thank you for sharing that. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking also here of, um, you know, Catherine Hayhoe's work on climate communication with evangelicals in which she talks about, um, you know, it turns out that there are certain frames that make, that are more likely to get purchased with different people with different ideologies. And that the frame of health, the frame of children, the frame of moral values, family values, as much as I might have my own issues with that as a progressive, that actually is a frame that gets people onto the same page or um, actually pollution. I'm thinking here about a lot of people who are, are pretty pretty right wing, but who care a lot about pollution. And so over pollution, you can have a lot of shared interests. What we need to be thinking, I think about is that there's, there's come become in the divisiveness that we have experienced this sort of like, you can't, you, you can't, um, we've become so balkanized that if that we're sort of unwilling to even collaborate, even temporarily build coalitions with people who might not be woke about all of the issues we care about. And so we refuse to even build coalitions about one thing that we might be able to get some progress on. And I think that's what we see in, in Congress and we see that in our communities and we see that in our classrooms that we that if we um, we get a signal that somebody isn't quite on board with let's say my my views about sexuality but they might be ill I might be able to work with them on climate I refuse to even talk to them in the first place and there's a real missed opportunity there to not only work on climate but to have the effect of maybe making them budge on these other issues right or being budged yourself on something you know I mean there's a real there's a real missed opportunity in our, in our balkanization that we that we don't um, in our sort of purity politics that so we don't uh, aren't willing to work with people just because they're refusing to call it climate. Maybe they're working on, on some other, they're poking on some other part of the elephant and that's, that's um, related to climate. But if they use climate change, they'll alienate their base or they alienate their, their funders or they alienate a lot of people who might be willing to work with them. I know I had a student who used to work for the Red Cross and they were doing all this great mapping around sea level rise and who was gonna be at risk for sea level rise. 
that seems like a good thing to do, but they couldn't talk about it being caused by climate change. And yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting debate. Can we, is that worthwhile work or not? Can, I mean, can we get behind that? Do we need to call them accountable to being, to sort of pointing to climate change, right? And what that would mean. And I, I guess I'm not, um, I'm not pure, I'm not a purist about that. I think there's so much coalition building we need to be doing. Um, and there's so much action we could be doing and so much shared common ground we could be having that I'm not, I don't feel like it's use, useful or worthwhile to get, you know, get caught up in our pure, pure zones, you know, um, around, you know, if you, if you can't call it climate change, if you can't point out to the, you can't hold the oil industry accountable that I'm ref refusing to work with you. There are so many steps to get between here and the ecotopia we want, you know, <laughs> that it might involve some compromises. Yeah, it makes me think about when I was first thinking about launching this community program, I was talking with our legislative representative of the Sierra Club to our Kansas legislature, and he said, it's, our answer is going to be with the farmers. We have to partner with the farmers. They're the ones already noticing the changes, already scared to death of the changes, you know, had this land for generations, and they see it, things changing in a way that they don't like. And if if we can't get past whatever other ideological differences we have. He, he says Kansas doesn't have a chance to make big changes in, in how we're addressing climate change. So that's a perfect example of that. And what a big deal that would be to build a coalition with farmers, you know, like that's exciting to me. If I might, I have a little bit of an anecdote I'd like to share. Um, so I am the daughter of a Kansas farmer and it, <laughs> yeah, that's my dad. Um, and, you know, we have really differed on our discussions when it comes to climate change, because I was like, I'm educated and I have an undergrad in conservation biology. Why aren't you listening to me? Why don't you acknowledge climate change? And that really polarized both of us and we never got anywhere. But now, um, especially after reading Sarah's book and taking more of a better and light, lighter footed approach, you know, I can see that he recognizes the change in the environment. We can pass field after field and he'll point out that isn't getting enough water. That's not getting enough water. That one's going to, he's going to have to collect insurance money because there's no way he's going to be able to make a profit off of that. So I know he sees these things, but he will never say that that is climate change. Yeah, that's a, these are such great stories. And I, I guess my point is, you know, can we figure out a way to work with that? You know, I mean, we be really would be wise if we could work with people who can't utter the word climate. The reason people can't utter the word climate is because of what's happened in dominant politics over the last 20 years, thanks to the oil industry. But that doesn't mean that a lot of people aren't being affected by it who refuse to call it that. And I think it's, when, forgive me on this like climate communication rant here, but um, climate communication experts are often trying to figure out what's gonna get people to, to get over their denialism or to get past the, the, the divisiveness of this culture where climate is in the left and you know, anti-climate is on the right. Um, and there was a long time when people were saying that people would care about climate change when they could physically perceive it. And, and risk perception experts who think about how it is that human or study how humans perceive risks have actually found that just physically feeling something doesn't necessarily translate it to you identifying that as a risk. If you're being told a story by someone you trust that the thing that's causing you a threat is, um, you know, is, is immigration, then you're gonna blame immigration. If you're sitting on your deathbed dying of COVID, you might be feeling COVID, but you can still not believe it's COVID killing you. You know what I mean? this actually happened, right? <laughs> so this is like an example, right? Same with climate change in California with the fires. People kept thinking, oh, when, the, when, when climate change starts impacting people, then the majority of people will start to care about it. And, we'll, and then we'll finally have a critical mass. Well, it turns out there are a lot of possible explanations that people have come up with for increased fires in California. And so if you don't, if you refuse to believe in climate change, you can maintain your logical cognitive world and not actually believe in climate change and still be going through all these experiences. So it turns out that these frames and these different ways of telling the stories and connecting the dots, who, would, who the messenger is, is going to be far more important. So if you come across as a leadist conservation biologist from your, you know, you're already, 
you're already lacking the credibility, right? You're already going to be at odds, right? Or if you come across as a climate, you know, <laughs> a left coast or climate elite, you know, you're you're not going to get anywhere. But if you're if you're the the trustworthy meteorologist on your local news is telling you that the weather you're experiencing is a result of climate change, you might actually start believing it. If your neighbors start telling you that what you're experiencing in your farm is a result of climate change, then those people you believe they might you might actually start believing it. So it's, it, it turns out it's the messenger more than feeling it that will get people to care more about it. And so that raises questions about who our messengers are, how can our messengers be more uh, credible, um, who can be our interlocutors to translate these messages, and how, you know, what is the way that we can reframe the issue that doesn't necessarily even bring climate change into the conversation. And this is where the work of um, Arlie Hochschild's Strangers in Their Own Land is so great, where she talks about the Green Tea Party. And the Green Tea Party is really concerned about what the oil industry was doing to the fisheries in the Gulf. And so there is a built-in audience right there of people who wanna get activated against the oil industry because it's threatening their, their industry. But they don't have to be left-wing progressive climate activists to get mobilized around this battle, right? So I just love those stories, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to add add one to that. Thinking about farmers in Kansas, that I think that there's um, this existential fear that many people don't want to go there. And so, in in our area in western Kansas, especially the Ogallala Aquifer, has been the aquifer of the irrigation aquifer. Like it's what everybody uses for irrigation for many generations, and it is scheduled to be depleted within. Well, within measurable time, some of, you know, depends on who you listen to, but 15, 20 years, that's going to be gone. That that aquifer is going to be empty. And who, nobody wants to go there, right? There's this fear of, oh my gosh, what if I admit that's true, you know, and I don't have the money to change my equipment and I don't, I don't know about permaculture. I don't understand what it would take to shift to regenerative agriculture. And I don't maybe not even know about those things. So I think there's this level of emotional dread in some cases against even wanting to talk about it, even wanting to go there, at least in my experience. Um, we're gonna skip, we're getting, we have about 20 minutes left. And um, I would like to ask you, Carly, first, have you seen examples of environmental racism within your community, specific examples that you could share with us? Yes. So um, I wanted to do kind of like a historic look and then also like a modern day look. And you actually brought up the East of Troost, which is really interesting that you bring that up, because if you historically look at Kansas City, um, people of color settled in the West Bottoms area and East of Troost, not on their own accord. They were forced into that area by the developer of Kansas City, J.C. Nichols which also led to, we knew that the West Bottoms flooded. We knew in 1903, the West Bottoms flooded and caused an immense amount of damage. We still put people there. We still redlined people into that area. And then when the flood came in 1951, and again in 1970, people, specifically communities of color, lost everything. So that's a, like a historic look at the environmental racism that is that has happened in Kansas City, but looking at a modern day example, specifically in Wyandotte County, um, in 2017, there was a health assessment done of the county. And one of the biggest uh, health risks we found was that there is an immense amount of food deserts in Wyandotte County, Kansas. Um, and the direct quote from this, and this was something that really hit me and has stuck with me constantly, was they put in another uh, dealership, another car dealership, but they can't put in a grocery store. And so I think that's a huge form. We see the capitalism. We see an area that's being preyed upon. You can put in another car dealership, but you can't provide your citizens with access to fresh food. So I think that's one of the clearest modern day examples of environmental racism that I can think of. Thanks, Carly. Who else, anybody else in the 
in our community here have examples that you're just real familiar with that you'd like to share? Well, I just used this example in a talk I gave a few days ago. It's really the Sierra Club's putting it together. Uh, so you can look it up on their website probably, but they talk about the energy burden concepts. If the people who are already, you know, in the most underprivileged position, have the oldest houses, have the, you know, equipment, the appliances that use the most energy, they have the least ability to replace them. They're paying higher energy prices, which means more of their income goes towards uh, energy rather than towards food, nutrition, those kinds of things. So all of that just piles up to keep those people even further and further down um, in terms of at least economic privilege. And um, very frequently, those communities are also communities of color and, and, and sometimes with a heavy immigrant population. So they're people who don't feel access to the policymakers. They're people who don't feel um, like their voice is heard or their, their vote is going to count. And so there's you know, like the whole community gets stronger if we can help those people get better appliances, you know, something as simple as that. And, but it's a, a blind spot for most of the policymakers. So it's a, yeah, it, again, not my example, CR Club uh, laid that out, but they also make that point about you can't deal with climate crisis without dealing with systemic racism. Thanks, Barbara. Anybody else on that? Sarah, do you have anything you wanna talk about with any specific communities that you personally know of? Like this wasn't part of what we talked about in advance, but- um, Yeah, I, I was just thinking, <laughs> one of the things I find really um, interesting is not just the cases where it's clear that um, climate injustice is happening in by different names in different communities, right? That's kind of what we're coming to here is that the way that climate injustice pans out looks really different in different communities and may not may not be that name, right? It may have something to do with, um, you know, access to medical, you know, it might have to do with medical justice. It might have to do with um, wastewater treatment. It might have to do with something to do with zoning. It might have to do with food deserts, right? It, it, it might look really different in lots of different places and, and not even have climate seem to be connected. But of course, people are making those connections and those dot connecting is really where, where we see the movement going, which is why we see something really different happening since um, in the last couple of years with the youth climate movement bringing adding to the pressure to bring the justice dimension to all that storytelling around all of these things about injustice you've been experiencing, here's how climate's gonna affect that or make that worse or how it fuels climate change, how those problems actually also add to climate change or whatever those dot, connecting those dots is happening, it's cool. That's awesome, I love that stuff and I'm, I'm really all for, um, you know, lifting up those stories and seeing how that works. But just as often we have stories of sort of the opposite happening, which is something example of my, in my community, um, where they're in order to, um, you know, improve and to get to, you know, the sort of idea of getting to, you know, zero emissions is a big thing. So everybody's, you know, campuses and communities are talking about climate action plans and getting to bring their emissions down or their waste down or whatever. There's various ways that people are measuring, uh, measuring their climate action. And in our community, a big way to do that was to move towards some, some more wind power. And so there was a huge wind um, power project proposed in, a, in our local, local area called Terrigen last year, maybe it was the year before last. And it, it was really, it was going to be put on some indigenous sacred land. And even though the, the tribe didn't own that land anymore, it was still sacred land. And so it created this rift in the climate community here between people who who wanted you know who felt that we needed to go to move really press urgently on reducing our emissions and getting off of fossil fuels and the indigenous communities who kept saying that's just another form that's kind of green colonialism right like in the name of climate change you want to continue to uh, you know threaten our sovereignty and it's just adding insult to injury 
And so there was a there was a real division. It, it, it divided people on our campus. It divided our students from different faculty. It had massive ripple ripple out effects. And um, you had young young kids going to testify on this and crying about how they had to put up these wind power plants or they would die. You know, it was really the aff the affect about the debates around this that were that were held on the you know. In, in these community hearings and whatnot, really illustrated how the um, climate, how, how divided we are still are in this community here, and I think elsewhere too, around exactly these issues. So, um, you know, is indigenous sovereignty and climate justice issue, you know, when, when, does, climate, when does climate action actually rub up against questions of, you know, co conflict with questions of social justice? Um, I actually find those just as important to be thinking about as um, moments when we see climate change exacerbating social justice issues. The solutions to them also can exacerbate social justice issues, and that that's also um, we got to deal with that. You know, that's a real important point, Sarah. I for for me personally, my my focus is more the naturalist side, and I can remember when windmills, wind, wind farms were first being proposed in the state of Kansas and especially in the tall grass prairie area of the Flint Hills, which is this totally unique ecosystem. It's the last 4% of uh, unfarmed prairie and it can't be farmed because there's rocks, you know, within an inch under the soil. If it could have been farmed, it would have been farmed. It couldn't have been farmed. And I remember just all the research studies at the time, this was probably 10 or 15 years ago, it was quite a while ago. Um, some of the wind turbines were still uh, being placed on the important bird flyways and you know, millions and millions of birds being killed because they put them where the best wind was, which coincidentally was where birds tend to migrate, right? Let's use the jet streams and see how fast we can get to where we're going. And so there's this inner conflict within myself, right? Yeah, let's put up wind turbines, but let's don't destroy the Flint Hills and the tall grass prairie areas and let's take care of the birds. And, and then you get into the whole, how many people live in that? So Chase County, for example, I don't know, I'm gonna guess there's like one person per square mile. I mean, it is not highly populated, right? So in the scheme of things in the state of Kansas, there's not much clout. There's no clout in that area, except that the woman who happened to be governor at the time this was happening was Kathleen Sebelius, was uh, a lover of the Flint Hills of Kansas and put a moratorium on putting those in. And it's just, it's all so complicated and it's all so, um, you know, it's, it's like those people who don't have a voice, who live in areas, you know, like you're talking about the indigenous people that they didn't even own that land anymore, yet it still was their spiritual land. And, you know, how do you evaluate all that? I'm, I'm meandering, sorry. Okay. No, it's true. Anybody... And I'm thinking here of some people's great work. Birds are a great example that a lot of the actions you can take to deal with climate change are really bad for birds. I mean, there's a, there's a thing, right? And so it's, you know, it is complicated. Just saying something's good for one dimension of the environment doesn't mean it's good for another dimension. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it, we're constantly balancing the, the, what's the cost benefit of any particular action and you know when we when we constantly drill in the point that climate change is the utmost most important existential threat of our time if we don't do things that whole line means that what we're asking for is people to put climate as a priority over all of our other priorities and it's wonderful when they are synergistic it's wonderful when you can attack climate change and solve multiple problems at the same time but oftentimes the opposite is true, right? It takes resources away from something that's a value to people and puts it somewhere else. And unless you can get people on board with climate change being the number one existential threat of our time and will agree to that sacrifice, you've got problems and you can start to see why climate change is so hard to, to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've just got about seven minutes left. And so I am going to, uh, 
read the last question here. We started talking about hope and we're gonna end talking about hope. Um, in your discussion of hope, Sarah, you say that you agree with Derek Jensen's conclusion that quote, hope is a longing for a future condition over which you have no agency. It means you're essentially hopeless, unquote. But you add that we need critical hope and radical imagination about our desired future. So what do you have to say about that? <laughs> yeah, I, that section of the book is called Moving Beyond Hope. And there was a moment there where the a draft of it was called Ditch Hope. And I realized that the argument I was making was not actually ditching hope. I was, I was just trying to, you know, complicated a bit. Um, and I suppose some of the really great criticism of hope I really like is stuff by Rebecca Solnit um, and various other, you know, thinkers and writers that I just love. Um, even Cornell West has some really amazing stuff on hope. Bell Hooks, Paulo Freire, there's some really great scholars out there who've written about hope. And so I'm not just kind of making this up in my own heart. Um, but this notion that hope can be some an excuse to defer the work or an excuse to hope that somebody else does the work oftentimes is the problem with it. And so it has to be kind of married with this um, a different type of definition. Some people talk about a utilitarian hope that is all about, well, I, I'm only going to have hope if I know that my work will have some outcome, right? That kind of what we were talking about that at the beginning. Um, so these are all kind of problematic forms of hope for me, right? And also, I don't particularly think that hope is the end game. I'm sort of with Greta Thunberg on this and also other scholars I cite in my book about who talk about, you know, this sort of very common trope, at least in interviews on podcasts and certainly in the way we organize our classes where we, we do doom and gloom and awful things, awful things, awful things. And then the last week of class, we have one article on hope, you know, and we say, okay, go have a great summer. Kids have, you know, hope you hope you were fine after all of that trauma, you know? And, um, you know, you, you can't just sort of solve all the problems with like a nice dose of hope, you know, it doesn't work that way. And Greta Thunberg argues and other people argue that um, hope is the, is the outcome of the actions, not the recipe for the actions, you know, it's not like the thing that's going to get us to act. So why do we keep on this constant hunt for hope, you know, it, we should be on this hunt for something else. And so I was really interested in the, actually thinking about hope is what made me research the book in the first place. If hope isn't where we're trying to end with our students, where, what is that emotional outcome that we need them to get to, to do this work? And so that's kind of why, where I started with hope. It turns out it's not hope. It turns out, you know, hope isn't the end game. Hope is the, hope is the outcome. And, um, I think what I mean by critical hope and a radical imagination is that um, so I heard someone recently, and I can't remember who, I feel like I need to, I wish I could quote the person correctly, but um, that hope is defined by the capacity to feel like you have some control over the conditions of your life. That kind of really narrow view of hope sounds to me also like um, empowerment, or it sounds to me like efficacy or some other emotion that's not just hope. And um, to me, that make, that resonates with how I experience young people in my classes, that they don't necessarily need hope. They want a sense of purpose. They want to make meaning out of their trauma. They want to have some kind of, you know, reason to live on the planet. You know, they don't want to be nihilistic. They want to, they don't have to be happy. They just need to have some reason to get up in the morning and get to work, you know. Um, and that that's more efficacy. That's having control over the conditions of your life. Like if I wake up in the morning and I do certain things, my life will be will have purpose or it will be better. And so I suppose that's that's where the radical imagination comes in. If it, I looked into the research after my students could not imagine a future that they wanted to live in. I was so shocked and horrified and heartbroken by this exercise where they visualize the future and they couldn't visualize the future that I thought if they can't even visualize the future, this will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. This isn't about hope. This is about, they actually have to know where they're going to even take, take a step forward in that direction or even have a desire to do that. You know, if they don't desire their future, what's the point of hope? <laughs> you know? So sort of hope just kind of made, you know, I just needed to get more concrete and specific. What was the point of it, you know? Um, the point of it was to get students to feel like they had some control over the conditions of their lives and their futures, and so that they could imagine desiring and thriving in a future rather than just fearing in the future. And that required a radical imagination that would be very against all of the images and visualizations that they've been given by dominant 
you know, dominant society telling them how their future is going to be unlivable. So I just wanted to get much more into the finer grain of what that hope was going to be built on, you know, what, what was the end game of that, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, you might want to still call it hope, but I just wanted to get in, you know, what were we really working on when we were working on students to give them hope, you know? Uh, they didn't need just to be told that everything's covered, you'll be all right, just keep on keeping on, it'll be okay. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't the hope uh, that was working for them. Yeah, one of the things I think about that um, I think also helps people have hope, very much agree with everything you said about empowerment and efficacy, but also like, I feel like we got here because of pathological arrogance in everything we've been doing for so, so long, and that the change is gonna come from this deep humility, but acting anyway. Like we know we don't know all the answers. We don't know exactly how to take care of the birds and the tall grass prey and get renewable energy going. We don't know yet. And we have to tolerate this ambiguity. We have to tolerate our not knowing, but still use our wisest understanding of things. and act boldly and courageously anyway, you know? So there's something about that, you know, thank goodness we're no longer arrogant the way that we used to be, but this is a fuzzy place to be in and we have to be okay with that and still act. Some people I think want that certainty before they can take some steps, but so courageous boldness or something like that <laughs> has to go into the mix. Um, Christiana Fieras in The Future We Choose is a book she's just written, um, calls it Gritty Optimism. I don't know if that is something you prefer, but um, I just love what you said there, Barbara, about ambiguity, tolerating ambiguity. Um, I, I really feel like that's that's where the radical imagination comes in. And, and there's some real culture shift that has to happen here. And 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 actually, when you say we, we and we've been in this arrogance, there there are so many people who haven't. And they might actually have some instructions for us about how to tolerate ambiguity and how to proceed, you know? Um, so they're, they're, we don't have to come up with this stuff on our own. Lots of people uh, have traditions of this that we can take as models. Thank you so much. Um, so we're right, we're right at time. I wanna thank everybody for this. I wanna thank Barbara and Carly for your input, Carly for your idea in the first place. Um, to kind of do the reading and then follow up with this conversation with this shift towards uh, race, ecological racism and, and justice. And um, grateful to Brenda Bennett Pike for creating most of the questions that we asked today. And of course, Sarah, for your, uh, your insight, your gracious ways of being and, um, and for all that you do. So, the climate of community events are on hiatus for this summer. We're gonna be building, um, uh, we're hoping to build an online community platform. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, but I wanna thank everyone for being here. Barbara, do you have a couple of words you'd like to say before we go? Well, I just wanted to say we're on hiatus unless I have feelers out to a couple other authors and if they say yes in the summer is when they want to do it we'll be we'll be you know so don't write us off completely but yes mostly we're going to be working on this online uh, community building thing yeah. anybody else anybody have anything they want to end with or um okay thank you everyone uh, watch for an email. It'll be a couple of days before we get the video edited and up on our YouTube site. And uh, thank you. I want to thank you, all. resilient activists, and Barbara and Carly, and combining together, and Brenda. Just um, you all have been just such a welcoming group, and it's been so fun to learn more more from you all and hear more what you're doing. You inspire me so much. So just thank you so much. I'm very honored. Thanks, Glad Sarah. we found each, each other. We found you. You found us. Whatever the right answer is. Good to have you. Glad we mind melded is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>